Well, now we can talk a bit about your work in sustainable freight um, transportation. So you've led ITF's two-year project on enhancing connectivity, sustainability, and resilience of freight transportation in Southeast Asia. And it's a fascinating topic. So with freight demand in the region pro projected to more uh, more than double by 2050, how should we think about the policy and infrastructure investment framework needed to expand capacity, cut emissions, and also strengthen resilience? Yeah, it was a really interesting project to get to work on. Um, and, you know, I was really grateful for all the support of the, the different um, governments and, and stakeholders in the region. Um, I learned a lot. I was not entirely familiar with the region um, before starting this project. So it was a really cool experience for me to get to do this. But Southeast Asia as a whole is really growing fast, uh, both in terms of population and uh, economic growth. And so you um, can un can imagine that there's expected to be this huge growth in freight transportation um, from now until 2050, as we were able to show with our, our forecasting models. And, um, you know, they're also, they're consuming a lot of goods, but they're also becoming a major manufacturing hub. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a big challenge. And I think the governments in the region all recognize that, um, you know, the current infrastructure networks that they have and the trade frameworks that they have are just not sufficient to support that kind of growth. It would put a huge strain on their infrastructure and lead to big cost increases and a lot of delays. Um, so what we tried to do was really help um, provide some advice on different ways that you could try to address those challenges by expanding, improving connectivity, um, but also keeping in mind the goals of having a more sustainable freight transport system and also um, in, including resilience. And um, I think we can talk a little bit more about resilience later on. Um, but right now, you know, the connectivity within the region is relatively limited. Um, as somebody shared an anecdote with me that oftentimes goods going from Jakarta to other places in Indonesia, some of the more remote islands often have to go through the port of Singapore in order to get there um, because the port of Singapore is really well connected, but some countries are not even necessarily very well connected to each other. Um, and so what we ultimately found um, was that you, you need to do two things in, um, co in combination with each other. So it's not enough just to build new infrastructure, you know, it's definitely uh, one step in the right direction to, you know, expand ports and fill gaps in the railroad network and, you know, um, make bigger highways. Uh, but that's not necessarily when you're talking about freight transportation, you also need to be thinking about what we call like soft measures. And that's stuff like trade facilitation, um, you know, making uh, customs processes more digital. And so that any time that you have an interaction between two countries, it's a little bit more streamlined and smooth. So when you're crossing at the border, you're not getting bogged down by, you know, hours and hours of delays. Um, in some cases, you know, trucks can wait days at border crossings to get goods across because they have to go through all these paper forms and those forms have to be checked against databases and stuff like that. Um, so these kind of soft measures where you're actually um, making it easier to go uh, to take goods from one country to another can also really, really help to improve connectivity and, I mean, also sustainability and resilience as well. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately the biggest takeaway for me from this project was that those three pillars that you mentioned at the beginning, you know, connectivity, sustainability, and resilience, um, people shouldn't be thinking about them in isolation from each other. You shouldn't be coming up with like a freight connectivity plan, a freight sustainability plan, and a freight resilience plan, because they're all connected. Um, and in a lot of cases, they're complementary to one another, right? So we actually produced a report kind of exploring the relationships between those three pillars. Um, and you can think of, you know, pretty obvious examples. So one would be like adding better intermodal infrastructure so that it's easier to take goods from a port onto a railroad or from a port onto the highway um, or from a railroad onto a highway. And of course, that improves your connectivity. You know, it's slows down the amount of time needed to um, to exchange between those two modes. It gives you more options in terms of modes. So if the highway gets bogged down, you can switch your um, your goods onto rail. Um, but it's also more sustainable because it makes um, you know rail a little bit easier to use vis-a-vis -vis, um, highways if it's better connected to the ports. Um, and it's also more resilient because you have, you know, it's easier to switch again, like I just mentioned, you know, easier to switch goods between modes if some kind of disruption were to happen. Um, so that's an example of something that's sort of complementary across all three pillars. Um, but in some cases, it's also 
there's a, some trade-offs involved, right? So if you were to expand a highway, for example, that would probably improve your connectivity, especially if the highway was congested, but it might attract some demand away from the railroad network or like a coastal shipping um, towards the road network, which generally has much higher um, carbon intensity than those other two modes. Um, so in that case, you have uh, connectivity improving um, enhancement that's potentially um, you know, decreasing your sustainability. So I think understanding those different connections is really important. And I think it just by kind of identifying them, it helps policymakers to understand, you know, how they can choose the bundle of policies that really um, maximize the benefits and, you know, minimize those trade-offs. So you have to find a bit of a happy equilibrium between the three pillars. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, like, like I mentioned, you know, they're usually complementary to each other. So a lot of the times, you know, trying to improve one also improves another. Um, and what we showed in our report uh, was that, you know, those three things generally all go hand in hand. So we had, we explored some different scenarios where you just focused on only connectivity improving measures, and then you added connectivity and sustainability improving measures. And what you saw was that connectivity also went up when you added the sustainability measures, right? So um, in general, I don't think it's a big trade-off, but those trade-offs do exist in some cases, and you need to be aware of them um, when you're you know, coming up with strategic plans. Speaking of which, um, which targeted infrastructure policy measures would you say deliver the biggest gains in all three pillars? Yeah, there's um, there's not exactly a kind of one size fits all solution. And, um, you know, it really does need to be kind of more of a holistic program of improving, you know, many different parts of the freight network. Um, and also those soft measures that I mentioned, you know, improving um, connect or improving cross-border connectivity by, you know, reducing the, the burden on um, customs and other administrative processes. But in general, I think in, in Southeast Asia, especially um, improving the rail connections on the mainland, especially um, is really important. There are some big gaps in the rail network as it currently stands. And so making it easier to transport freight um, between countries like Thailand and Cambodia and Vietnam and Laos um, is really important and will help encourage more sustainable mode choice, but also create, um, you know, stronger connections for rail freight. And then, like I said, you know, also make um, improve resilience by just creating another option. If there's flooding on the highways, you know, maybe the rail network will stay open. And so you can um, reroute your goods quite easily. So I think that um, is a major one. I mean, of course, in Southeast Asia, a lot of freight is transported uh, by maritime shipping. And so um, trying to reduce the carbon intensity of maritime shipping is important. It's already, you know, in terms of like um, emissions per unit of weight, um, it's very efficient. So we should be encouraging more, um, more maritime shipping relative to kind of land transport, but um, trying to make sure that the vessel fleets in the region are uh, using the latest technology to try to reduce carbon emissions is, is quite important. Um, also making sure that those fleets have access to, you know, renewable energy um, when they're in the port. So that's, you know, creating shore power connections for them so that they're not having to burn fuel uh, while they're sitting idle in the port um, to, to kind of keep the ships running, I think is also an important uh, practice. And then, you know, I've touched on this a couple of times, but, you know, reducing delays, especially at border crossings um, is, you know, it's not as much of a, a major infrastructure investment. You know, it doesn't cost billions of dollars. Um, it's complicated. You have to, you know, align a lot of different stakeholders, but it's a relatively low cost, I think, improvement um, that can help um, cut delays pretty substantially and improve connectivity. You've talked about this a bit, but um, how can coordinated freight strategies across the Southeast Asian countries boost cross-border um, efficiency and competitiveness without compromising the sustainability aspect? Yeah, I think I mentioned some examples already. I mean, um, there is a lot of great cooperation in the region. Uh, there's the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, is sort of a, a regional um, supranational body that helps to coordinate on a lot of transport issues. Um, also, the United Nations uh, Economics and Social Commission for the Asia and the Pacific, UNSCAP, um, does a lot of work to try to help align transportation strategies between countries. But, you know, like I talked about with cross-border rail corridors, you do really need strong coordination uh, between countries in order to make that a success. 
And um, I think also like digitalization of trade and customs documents. It's another area where you really need multiple countries working together. Um, otherwise, it doesn't necessarily, you know, if trading with one country requires a completely different set of documents and has different driver licensing requirements than trading with another country, that's ultimately going to make um, shippers have to spend more money to adhere to all those different requirements. So if you can get, you know, everyone within the region who's trading with each other on board, um, that really does help to to reduce costs and make the um, make the freight transport sector more competitive. That makes sense. And I guess you're at a perf the perfect place at the ITF because you have the international aspect, a platform for all these different countries to collaborate and communicate with each other. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so that that was great. We were able to bring together uh, a number of the countries in Southeast Asia for um, a high level dialogue in Jakarta in April, um, where, you know, uh, kind of senior level technical staff from each of the ministries came and joined us at an event that we were hosting um, where we presented the results of the study. And then they also explained how, you know, the issues that they were facing in their countries and, you know, how the, the study might be able to help them address those issues. Um, so it is really nice to be able to convene, you know, different policymakers from across the region and not just present them with a report, but also kind of like have a real strong dialogue um, about how um, the work that we're doing can help, you know, help resolve some of the issues that they're facing.